Um, so this paper is based on my PhD research at the University of Sheffield with English Heritage. Um, my project's called The Evolution of Audley End. So I'm looking at Audley End House in Essex, which you can see here, which is a palatial Jacobean manor house with 18th and 19th century interiors and a wide, very designed capability brown landscape. Um, so I'm based in the archaeological collections from the site. I'm looking at artifacts from excavations within the house and gardens. So there are three stages to my project. The first is to collate and write the results of an excavation from the 1980s, which wasn't at all published. And the second is to carry out new research on the finds from this excavation. And the third is to explore how the collection has been managed and how it could be used for research and for interpretation in the future. And so today, I'm going to discuss how this project relates to broader theoretical concepts of biography and also to the display of archaeological collections in historic properties. And so I'm really led by storytelling, how objects can reveal new narratives, and the research potential, or perhaps the absence of potential, within an unconsidered yet surprisingly complete archaeological collection. Um, so country house studies are traditionally led by architectural and art histories. Um, the academics have explored country houses as cultural entities, powerhouses representative of the nobility of the, as they navigated their social and their political worlds. Um, inside, focus is often placed through research and interpretation on arts, visual arts and furniture collections. Um, elite are inevitably the key players in this narrative. They chose what was in their space. Um, there's a focus on decadence rather than deference, on display and interaction between peers rather than the demands that these lifestyles placed on other people. Um, houses particularly tell the story of, ancest of ancestral families, um, often because these families still have an important role in the ownership and the delineation of access in country houses. Um, in the 21st century, however, we're starting to deconstruct and openly problematise country house studies, um, inquiring into the role of servants and slavery, into gender and sexuality, as well as exploring the ongoing process of conservation and curation, and the design and display is becoming increasingly challenging and provocative. Um, archaeology itself is a valuable tool, I think, in the shift towards a more inclusive and nuanced understanding of life in the country house. And so I'm researching Audient House, um, it's in Essex, with, and it has lots of complex and quite intersecting narratives. So originally, it was a Benedictine monastic estate called Walden Abbey. Um, in 1538, after the dissolution of the monasteries, it was granted by Henry VIII to a man called Sir, uh, to a man called Sir Thomas Audley, a lawyer who was the Lord Chancellor and partly responsible for both the rise and the fall of Anne Boleyn. So quite a well-known figure. Um, he recreated the structure as a fashionable mansion. We can see this on the bottom right. Um, which had rooms for his family, for domestic staff, and an elaborate suite for guests. Um, yeah, it's in this copy of the 16th century map. That's the only visual representation we have of it. Um, and we know from that that he created a courtyard house. So he built this kind of square structure with a social garden space in the middle. Um, but we don't know much about the layout of rooms or the extent of reuse of the monastic property. Um, that's because this was completely demolished and rebuilt in the early 1600s by Thomas Howard and the Duke of Suffolk and James I Lord Chamberlain, so also very well known in society. Um, he built a prodigy house, an elaborately decorated, almost palatial manor house, surrounded by external pleasure gardens and made to be quite sumptuous with detailed external symmetry, which we still have today. Um, it was designed mainly to entertain James I, who liked to travel around and visit all his subjects. And um, so it has these really quite unique twin apartments for a king and queen in the upper floors. Um, it cost Howard £200,000, which was so much money that he embezzled from the crown to pay his debts and was ultimately disgraced and spent the rest of his life living at Audley. Um, it was owned briefly by Charles II, who appreciated its proximity to new market races. Um, but at this point, contemporary docu documents describe it as literally falling down with pieces of the roof landing below on unsuspecting guests. Um, so at the start of the 18th century, it was returned to Howard's family, who started the lengthy process of retrenchment or structural demolition of the external walls, and really bringing the house um, into a smaller space until it's one third of the size of this house as was. Um, so in the late 18th century, Sir John Griffin Griffin, um, an army lieutenant, was gifted the house by his rich aunt, Elizabeth Countess Portsmouth. He became the first Baron Braybrook and made a range of architectural changes he brought in Robert Adam, who's a famous Scottish architect, 
to build some ground floor rooms, he brought in Capability Brown to redesign the landscape. Um, the house was owned by his dynasty until 1941, where it was requisitioned for use in the Second World War and used for the Polish branch of the Special Operations Executive, which is a completely interesting story in itself. Um, the family, however, suffered personal and financial losses in this period, um, and they weren't prepared to reclaim and refurnish the property. So the Ministry of Works wanted it to start their National Heritage Portfolio. Um, so they purchased it in 1948, their first um, country house, um, with much of the interiors still unknown from the family. So there's some great stories in there. Um, but how to research and tell them is really an ongoing process at Audi and House, and one that I hope to engage with. Um, so we have a um, quite overlooked but also quite innovative garden excavation in the 1980s and by the Chelmsford Archaeological Trust, um, restoring the elaborate Jacobean revival part of the garden. Um, this is part of a trend towards using archaeology to reconstruct design landscapes with um, building features um, in correlation with documentation. Um, so this excavation um, made keyholes into the flower beds, as we can see on the upper picture. So they literally dug into the flower beds, recorded information at the bottom, and then refilled them. Um, so there's this kind of structural information at the bottom, and a large body of material culture from within the flower bed itself. Um, contains objects from Roman all the way to the 1980s, um, from ceramics and glass objects to carved stone and metalwork. I also have the associated paper archive from this excavation, um, so things like content sheets, fines registers, and draft reports. Um, but now it's in an almost forgotten archive at Rest Park, um, which is English Heritage's one of English Heritage's collection stores, um, which we can see down here. Um, incomplete catalogue in the um, HOMS, and is organised only by material type. Um, so it's basically inaccessible to the researcher or to anyone wanting to use its material in display. And when the archive was deposited, there wasn't a strategy for the selection and retention of the material. So not all of it is necessarily useful to English Heritage as a repository. If we applied English Heritage's modern acquisition strategy to the material, the composition of the archive would be massively altered. Um, so, and there's lots of these archives in heritage bodies and private house trusts. And so I'm wondering, how can we research and display these objects as part of understanding the country house? Can it present new narratives, new ideas, can it contribute to the broadening, perhaps the querying, of um, country house narratives? Is it meaningful to retain this archive for research? And um, with current discussions taking place, as we've partly discussed today, about rationalisation in the face of what is definitely a crisis in storage, and um, these are certainly interesting questions to try and answer. Um, so here's some things that my research can tell us. Um, so the Tudor house seems to have been based in the monastic. Um, with elements like a series of floor tiles from the north aisle of the church kept literally in situ as part of a small room. Which is quite interesting. Um, stone walls were reconstructed and built on top of the original monastic space. Um, so what did this mean? Were they just reusing expensive materials? Or were they literally supplanting the past? And how did this alter their perceptions of um, the dissolution? Um, ceramic analysis, meanwhile, has in revealed increases in the use of locally made, inexpensive, yet quite fashionable, almost trendy ceramics, lots of those used for dining and drinking. Um, this kind of links into the loss of fortunes of the house owners. Um, as they got poorer, they seem to have made use of more widely available kinds of ceramics made within Britain, but also those like blue and whiteware that bear a visual similarity to the highly prized porcelain of China and Japan. Um, so there's also a dining expansion in this period. You start needing more and more objects to fulfill the expectations of more multi-course dining systems um, within your social, you know, quite an elite social group. Um, so the fundamental question is, who is using these items? Are servants making the most of the consumer revolution? Um, that's kind of cycle through and gain these ceramics from their owners. Or are the house's owners trying to replicate this lost wealth? Um, so I'm looking to answer these questions through exploring systems of the deposition of the material that led to these patterns, and producing really a multi-voiced biography of the archive and of the artefact. A bit of theory for you. Um, artefact biography is an academic concept, but one that can, in my opinion, lend itself to studying and interpreting a wider archaeological archive. Um, so objects obviously have a biography in their, in their production, in their use, in their deposition, and in their curation. Um, Gell talked about biography as the interplay between social relationships and objects, he argued that interactions between people inform their agency in the creation of material objects that can be thus researched as social agents themselves. 
Um, after I said that objects have life histories based in their interaction with political action, some of my favourite quotes, and we have to follow the things themselves for their meanings are inscribed in their forms, their uses and in their trajectories. And so American historical archaeology um, is really engaging with these questions. So Dietz in Small Things Forgotten, I'm sure many of you know about, and tells the story of objects as means to explore the nuances of early American life. And similarly seen in Wilkie's The Archaeology of Mothering, which tells the story of an African-American midwife through objects found in a well. Um, objects are highly personal and resonant to the individual. They have a meaning that can be difficult to interrogate, but can reveal much about individual life paths and choices. Um, and this can be integrated with a biography of archive, how these objects have been organized and curated once they were found, how this alters people's perception of those artifacts and the places associated with them. Um, biography as an approach helps mediate the relationship between object, place, and person. Um, in my case, that bounded by a shared architectural entity, a country house. So biography really provides quite an interesting opportunity to present objects and artifacts within historic houses um, that are contextual information for the houses themselves. And there's really a reciprocal relationship here between the curated object and the curated space, and we have the opportunity to play with both, which is really fun. Um, something seen a lot in the US, where the earliest houses of the 18th and 19th centuries are often excavated and have developed their own archaeological units, and something we don't necessarily have here. Um, so a good example is Monticello, um, which is Thomas Jefferson's plantation. Um, they carried out a reassessment of Mulberry Row, which was the main street where the both enslaved and free workers lived on the estate and during the Jeffersonian era. So they carried out archaeological surveying, excavation and recording, and they found that the use of fashionable tea-drinking ceramics, the same kinds we get at Audley, also increased over time, um, suggesting a gradual relationship with the consumer revolution of the 18th and 19th centuries, um, something that reflects deliberate choices and investments in material culture made by people whose choices outside of this home space were so limited. Um, so 2012, they opened um, Landscape Slavery Mall Bureau at Monticello, in um, which they put the artifacts from the excavation on display on the tables, almost as though you were dining, um, so that people could explore the shift visually and through individual biographies of certain people named in records that definitely lived in these houses. Um, so another example is Chatsworth Renewed, um, which told stories about how the house has been perceived and curated across time to mark 10 years of repairs being completed. Um, direct engagement was made here with the material, um, bringing it in with the fabric of the house, um, which included archaeological objects. It tells about history, but also about memory, about curation, and about the potential features that the house faced. Um, archaeology was part of an interweaving narrative of people and places. So I wonder, how can we apply this to Audley? So we have a really good opportunity at Audley in the museum room. So the fourth Baron Bray Rook, you can see on the right, Richard Neville, um, owned all the ends of the 19th century and was a keen archaeologist and natural scientist. He published works about Roman Essex and collected archaeological objects, many of them from Great Chesterford, which is just down the road, um, and he kept them in a museum at Audley End. Um, however, when he died, objects eventually went across to Cambridge Museums, um, and the last known use of this room was an office. And we could recreate the space. Um, we could use pictures of the room, which we do have, um, combined with artefacts from the excavation. Um, in particular, there's some really high-class Roman pottery in the um, archive, which we didn't know about until I started looking through it, um, which are, whether from this antiquarian activity himself, or whether they're connected directly to the local area. And we could present these to tell the story of a rich archaeological, archaeological landscape from past to present. Um, how country housing states had a primary role in the development of archaeology as a discipline, um, and how much we know about the country house from how it has been researched and curated. Um, so the academic theory of biography would enable quite, a, I think, quite creative interventions of material culture within such a richly and quite interestingly historical space. So to sum up, um, I think that having a academic project um, enables the acquisition of more detailed knowledge about the collection and the interrogation of certain patterns and discrepancies in the artefacts and the information about them. Um, it's an opportunity for the new curation and display of these materials. It can be quite low cost um, because these materials have already been excavated and are currently sitting. Um, it's, it's quite a good low cost opportunity to get them to the house. Um, and it can maybe provide a more inclusive interpretation of country houses um, my work really seeks a meaningful understanding of the biography of the collection and the artefacts within it. Thank you.